Hello, everyone, and thanks again for clicking into another edition of Sit Down with Ed Brown. Today's guest joins us from Arizona, where he's always actively researching the Arizona Bigfoot, known as the Mogollon Bigfoot. Now, I know we've all seen at least one of the videos uh, that, he's, that he's been kind enough to share with us, so please welcome Mr. Mitchell Waite. Hey, Mitchell, how are you doing tonight? Oh, I'm doing pretty good. Um, just wondering if we're going to get some rain or not. <laughs> we're actually in the exact same boat here in Ohio. They've had a very, very windy day, a lot of clouds, but it's been, uh, you, know, you never know, I guess. Mother Nature's a, a funny, funny woman. <laughs> Mitch, I always like to get these things started off by asking, how did you get interested in the Bigfoot subject to start with? Well, th this will take a few minutes because That's when I, I actually didn't believe in the Bigfoot. I was a non-believer. I was a skeptic. Um, even though I grew up hunting, fishing, camping, hiking the Arizona mountains, um, anything that was weird that happened, I I wrote it off as being a bear or a mountain lion or, or you know, maybe a person playing a joke or something like that. But uh, my early ancestors uh, settled northern Arizona, and uh, they left stories of, the, at that time they called it the hairy man or the crazy man wild man and um, they talked about how it sometimes would come out of the mountains and and uh, maul the cattle and create havoc and scream at people and stuff like that wow. uh, so they, they had all these stories and uh, I grew up listening to these stories around the campfire and I always thought that they were stories that were meant to scare the kids uh, into staying close to camp during deer season. And uh, so I grew up not believing. And But however, I wanted to, to save these stories. So we recorded them down in a book, and we, which is uh, The Mogan Monster, Arizona's Bigfoot. And those are basically campfire stories. Okay, we didn't mean for them to be proof of anything. Right. Um, so we got it published, and um, we sold our first batch of books over the next couple of years. And then I didn't know if I wanted to expend the resources to go back and do a reprint. So I laid off a little bit, and uh, a year later, I found uh, was perusing through uh, Amazon.com, and I found that one of the, my copies was going for about three hundred dollars. Wow. <laughs> so I oh, well, they've got to re uh, reset this. So we did. Uh, about a year later, uh, it was written under uh, my wife's on the plume, Susan Farns, and uh, or Susan Farns word, mm -hmm. and uh, we did that because at the time I was in the military and I didn't want to have to go through military hoops to get anything published. Um, and that's how it is. If you're a military member, you know, probably something you have to have military approval. Wow. So um, she put it under her name, and um, we compiled it together. And anyway, we was uh, on the Internet, and I just happened to Google Susan Farnsworth, and there was an article that said Susan Farnsworth was the expert for the Arizona Bigfoot. <laughs> and I kind of like, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> it's quite an honor. So, you know, so I was still a non-believer at that time. And uh, we started getting reports from people uh, that wanted to tell their story. And a lot of them were from here in Arizona. And so we're kind of, I'm kind of thinking, well, you know, this is really awesome. People are wanting to share their stories and their experiences and so forth. And we got a couple that were really fresh. Uh, happened just a few days before. And 
so we decided to go up there and look for it and see if we could find any evidence of this really happening. So we went up to uh, the mountains where they, they said this was happening, and uh, we searched all day long and didn't find a thing. So we pitched a cold camp at a trailhead, and uh, about 3 o'clock in the morning, I woke up with my nose uh, about three inches away from the top of the tent. Something was outside squishing the tent down on us. Right. And I heard the, the cocking of a pistol. And I looked over and it was uh, my companion there uh, grabbing the gun. As soon as that, that sound of that cocking pistol, uh, the tent was released and it popped right back up into a dome. So it scared us pretty bad. Sure. And, uh, I threw a lantern out and we got out of there, you know, pretty fast and came back in the day and got our stuff. Well, a couple of days later, I was talking to a cryptozoologist named Alex Hearn, and he said, well, uh, did you look for any tracks? I said, no, we were kind of busy getting out of there. <laughs> so he said, well, you know, would you go back if we put together a team? Ah, uh, sure. <laughs> go back there. So we put together a team. There was five of us. We went back and uh, we started looking around and we found uh, oh, various tree branches, uh, small tree branches stripped off the trees laying all over the forest floor. Uh, that was just down from where the um, tent was standing. And this seems weird, strange. So we hiked back around. We found a, a government rain gauge, uh, which is a you know a device to rain, measure the amount of rain. Mm -hmm. And it looked like somebody had wadded that up like a piece of paper. And uh, so that, we made it back out to the road and started back towards our vehicles. And uh, a horse trainer came down the road at that particular time, and he stopped and asked us what we were doing. Well, we were honest with, you know, Alex says, oh, we're looking for Bigfoot. And the horse ranger got a funny look on his face and says, well, that would certainly explain the strange scat that I've been finding. Oh, wow. And he says, I know the animal's up here, and this is something else. And so we talked for a little bit longer, and he just went on down the road. But as we were talking, one of my uh, friends, one of my researchers there, his name was Kyle Barentine. He's actually my next-door neighbor. He uh, kind of backed out of the group and walked over to the edge of the road while we were talking. And uh, when the ranger left, he signaled us to come over there and look real close. And he pointed out a 19-inch footprint. Oh, wow. And uh, it was only about 30 feet from where the tent had stood. And we cast that. I still have it. It's 19 inches long. It's, uh, I think it's 9 inches wide. And you can definitely see the toes. And it was a very heavy creature because it sunk into the mud quite a ways. Hmm. So and that's what got me. That's okay. what got me started. Well, that would do it. I mean, you know, this this cast you found, this cast you made, so it was pretty thick. It was in the mud, so it was a pretty thick cast, then, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's that's interesting because I've always kind of thought about that. You know, the weight ratio towards you know compared to what the ground surface is like, whether it's muddy, dusty, you know, dry, wet, whatever. Um, have, have you run into a lot of that where you see uh, footprints that are barely, barely, you can see it, but you can barely make it out, but you see like the trackway, so you know something was there, but there's no no way to cast it because it's just not thin enough or, or deep enough. Yeah, I, I see that all the time. Um, especially up there, there's a lot of pine needles, grass, and stuff. So you'll find large indentations. You'll notice the big and heavy was through there. Sure, you, sure. You, 
know, can't catch it. Um, it. It's very rare that you find a good castable print. And I think that sometimes because our, I think our Bigfoot knows about tracks. Mm-hmm. And I think they don't leave them very often. Right, right. Now, you started the Mogey Island Monster uh, website, .com, I guess. Um, tell us a little bit about that. What, what kind of work have you done with that? Okay, yeah, that was uh, actually started it shortly after the event with the crushed tent. That happened back in Memorial Day of 2008. And that's when I started MogeyOnMonster.com because I wanted to be able to exchange information uh, about the the Bigfoot. And, you know, I was totally naive. I didn't know anything. I didn't have any equipment or anything like that. Sure. Um, you know, so I started this website, and uh, it's actually named after a title given by the Boy Scouts of America. Um, there, They have had a camp called Camp Geronimo. It was under the Mogollon Rim, which is a, a big plateau up there in northern Arizona. It was discovered uh, back in the old early Arizona days by a um, Mexican explorer named Mogollon. And it's not pronounced the same way as it's spelled. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so it's a uh, Mo Gion. And um, anyway, they named it because back in 19, I think it was 57, uh, they had their camp running and, and a troop of Boy Scouts there, and a Bigfoot came and raided the camp. It uh, wow. tore the camp up and, you know, chased the boys around and, and uh, scared them so badly that they actually closed Camp Geronimo and moved it. It's now in a new location about, uh, I think it's about 50 miles away from the old one. Now, you and, mentioned, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, that's that's why they named it the Mogion Monster uh you know, that's what they called it, and the name just kind of stuck, or stuck, like uh, the Grassman of Ohio and the Skunk Cape of Florida and so forth. Sure. So that's how it came about. Right. Now, now you mentioned that story, and I think it's a fascinating story. You said it kind of chased them around. I mean, so they were actually, I mean, they saw it. They were being chased by it. Um, how long ago was that? I mean, what was that? You said it was a Boy Scout, so it had to have been fairly recent. No, I think that was about 1957. 57. Uh, D- Don Davis was one of the uh, um, cryptozoologists. He turned into a cryptozoologist after that. Wow. And he, uh, he talks about the experience, if you ever want to Google him and look him up. I think I will. And that was uh, Don Davis, you said? Yeah. All right, I'm going to write that down. And then uh, hopefully our listeners can do the same thing. Write that down and, and Google that when when the show is done. And uh, definitely be an interesting uh, piece of research. Now you, you know we hear a lot of different theories about what the Bigfoot is. You know, I mean you, everything from alien to the missing link to you know even shapeshifters. What do you think this animal is? I mean, do you think it's an animal? Do you think it's more man? What's your theory? Well, I'm pretty sure he's flesh and blood because I have sure. a photo photo of one with a bloody nose. <laughs> so, you know, I, I think it was pulling on my camera. I think it was a youth because I had my camera about eight foot up the tree. And um, the camera, the first shot is of a hand reaching up for it. And the hand looks a lot like an orangutan's hand. <clears throat> And uh, then the next shot is a picture of its half of its face, and it's got a bloody nose. So I think wow. what it was, Moon was trying to pull the camera down and slipped, and he socked himself in the face or something. Sure, sure. I'm, I'm going to have to look those pictures up as well, because that's, uh, that's, that's very interesting. Now, that was a trail cam you set out? Yes. Good deal, good deal. 
Now, when you go out and you're researching, you know, the Bigfoot, what is, you know, what's your approach to the research? I mean, what's the first thing you look for to make you think that one is either there or may have been there? Well, if I'm starting out in a new area uh, that I haven't checked out before, I, I try to look for four criteria. Okay. One one of them is lots of good, clean water because they need a lot of water and they don't like the cow ponds, cow, you know, scum stuff. Mm -hmm. they, they like, they have to eat a lot of food, both, they, you know, uh, bushes and, and uh, animals. So there has to be a lot of game and a lot of edible plants. Then they need uh, foliage to hide in because they're cryptic in nature. They like to hide. Mm -hmm. uh, then they need the lack of man. Uh, a lot of people see them near uh, buildings and stuff like that. I think that might be them just passing through. The actual clan stays put or follows the food. So if the food is pretty stable in the area, they'll they'll stay put. So. Uh, once I identify an area that meets that four criteria, I actually go in with uh, a set or several um, voice-activated or sound-activated recorders, and uh, and I'll leave those out for a couple of days. And those are actually better uh, to, to for determining if something's in the area than uh, game cameras are. Because with a voice-activated recorder, you can hide them completely, and right. uh, they still will record the sounds. Whereas a, a trail cam, usually you got to leave them semi-visible so that they can take a picture. Sure, sure. But uh, using uh, yeah, that uh, the sound-activated recorders, uh, generally speaking. During the night or early morning, they'll vocalize if they're in the area. Sometimes it's a call for them to come home. Uh, sometimes it's uh, mating calls, stuff like that, you know. But if they're going to do it, the voice activation will more than likely pick it up. Uh, yeah. And that covers a much, much, much larger area than a game camera will. A game camera only covers like a 90 degree angle from the lens uh, out about 100 yards, and that's it. Well, not even that. Uh, detection, detection range on most of the new ones are only 45 feet, so that's why I start with sound cams. I, I, I think that's a great. I think that's a great idea. And uh, using that technique, have you had any success? I mean, do you have videos that? Um, I'm sorry, sorry, audio that, that you have in your library that could, that is somewhat suspect as to what it could be? Well, you know, you, you're you not going to be able to prove what it is because there's sure. no, no uh, nothing. But that's one thing about being a cryptozoologist is you got to know the animals. you got to know what's in the area. And you got to know what they sound like uh, because a lot of times, the Bigfoot will mimic the animal. And um, so it's, yeah, I have left can, uh, the voice activated recorders out, and you can hear me walk away. You can hear me slam the door of my car and start up my vehicle. Now, of course, I didn't leave it on the road, I left it down in a little creek area. Sure. But you can hear me drive away. And, um, uh, a few minutes late, later, you can hear a, it almost sounds like an all clear sound. You know, whoa! <laughs> type thing, you know. And I, I kind of really think that was a, you know, it's gone all clear. That's interesting. Uh, then I've, I've also picked up some growls and grunts and screaming and uh, all kinds of good vocalizations like that that, uh, you know, I just can't believe that they would be elk. I don't think elk can sound that way. It sounds more like a, a pair of vocal cords from a primate. Mm -hmm. So, I've, I've heard some great um, reports, uh, reported sightings. Uh, one was from a uh, 
a gentleman of Indiana, his name was Kurt, ba- um, Kurt Ballard, and he was in Kentucky as a young boy, and he, and he made an interesting observation that, that I want to kind of bring up, and, and I, I'm bringing this up because of what you just said, but he said that he was watching the big, but he was, he was, you know, he was young, he was uh, hiding in some weeds where they had fallen asleep, and they were watching uh, a Bigfoot, and there was a scream that came from another direction, and that Bigfoot stopped what it was doing, basically, and, and walked into the direction where the scream came from. Now, I guess my question is, is that similar to the what they do to communicate? I mean, do you think there's a different scream for a different meaning, uh, one for the all clear, um, one for the, you know, time to come home, one, you know, you, you see what I'm saying? Yes. And I, I do believe that they do have signals for each other. Uh, uh, if there's danger in the area or just what. I think they also do a uh, come home thing to the juveniles. Mm-hmm. So I think think that juveniles go out sometimes to forage at night. And um, they'll stay out all night long like teenagers normally do. I <laughs> 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 So Pop gets up there on the the highest point and then screams out, you know, get your tails back here, you know. Right, right. In Bigfoot language. <laughs> sure, sure. I mean, you see it with other animals in the wild, so it, it would make sense that a Bigfoot would do the same thing. So I think that's a that's an interesting uh, interesting piece of tidbit there. I, I like that. Now, you've had several sightings, right? That's correct. All right. Have you ever been scared other than the time you were camping and the tent was down by your nose? I mean, have you ever been scared by something out there? Uh, you know, most of the time you don't really get scared until afterwards when you've had a little bit of time to think about it. Mm-hmm. Um, the only time that I've been really scared, uh, well, I can think of a couple of times. One time... I was asleep in my trailer, and the uh, one came up and shook my trailer and walked around to the back door and tried to yank it open. Oh, wow. And, but I have it reinforced with uh, angle iron and stuff like that, and I always keep it locked from the inside. And uh, so I had basically gotten down on the floor with my pistol in the very back of the trailer so if that door came off, I was prepared to protect myself. Sure, sure. Now, but, tell uh, me about you. Go ahead. The other time I was uh, checking out a cave, and uh, this happened not too long ago, uh, poking my nose in a cave. I, I didn't realize the cave was as deep as it was. Mm-hmm. It made the entrance look like it was only just a little ways in, so I stepped into the entrance, and then I noticed that the it really had an opening to the right, a 90-degree angle. And uh, that's when I heard the growl, and, uh, and I, I knew it wasn't a bear or a mountain lion because I saw the footprint on the ground. So... I backed out of there really, really quick. Quick. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. I, I, you know, it's funny because I, I don't think that the Bigfoot is an, an aggressive animal by nature. I do think that um, they are territorial, and I think they'll give you plenty of warning. And hopefully, you know, you you heed that warning before, um, I guess, before they basically make you leave. But um. Is that, is that kind of what you felt like there, that it was just saying, hey, look, you're in my territory, back off? Yeah, I think I surprised him because I, I think you're correct. If Given the chance and the, the opportunity, they will leave. They'll hide or depart. Uh, sure. If you've got them trapped or you're threatening one of their young, get too close to their young, or they feel threatened, they'll protect themselves. So, you know, it's no, they don't go hunting mankind. They they don't seem to to hunt you out or single you out unless you've done something to provoke them. Right. So uh 
normal, you know, the normal camper is perfectly safe. Exactly. Exactly. I, I would more worry more about the the threat of the other two legged critters in the forest. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you're right because you never know what um, some guy with a gun is going to do. You know, just just to try to be famous, and uh, it's a crazy, crazy, crazy thing. I mean, I I heard where in one of your videos, as a matter of fact, um, you said, "I am a Bigfoot researcher, not a Bigfoot hunter." And I think that's a great point. And I was hoping maybe you could enlighten the listeners on the difference. And I think that kind of coincides with what we're talking about. So uh, go ahead, explain the difference in that. Okay, the, the difference being is a uh, Bigfoot hunter is basically out for the proof. Uh, they want to capture, kill, uh, whatever, you know, get that million dollar photo or something like that. So they actually go out and try to stalk the Bigfoot. They'll camouflage themselves, they'll hide their scent, and they act like a predator. Well, I'm not that way. I'm beyond the proof. I've decided I already know they exist. Um, you know, and trying to prove it to a hardcore skeptic is fruitless, uh, you know, because that's just not going to happen. Um, what I am trying to do is take it a step beyond that. I want to know why do Bigfoot do what Bigfoot does? Um, you know, some of the mysteries behind them, how they can hide so well, uh, you know, because a lot of people think they're trans-dimensional. Um, why do they build uh, structures that seem to serve no purpose as far as shelter? Um why is there an enmity between them and man? Is it, you know, is it more than just a fear of the ultimate uh, predator, or is there something else? Did, did we have a a uh, problem with the Bigfoot back in ancient days, and they just don't like us anymore, or whatever? You know. Uh, so, you know, that's the kind of stuff I'm trying to figure out. I'm trying to figure out their growth rates, their birth rates, uh, what kind of foods they eat, um, habitat, you know, what do they range, what, and basically why they do what they do. Sure, that's what sure. a research does. Gotcha, gotcha. And, and I think that's great. And uh, I, I know there's a lot of really good researchers out there and there's also, unfortunately, a lot of hunters out there who are are willing to take that shot to uh, to prove to the world that the uh, Bigfoot exists. And uh, I'm not so sure that uh, that's the best um, theory to go by. You know, I, I think there's enough proof now. But you know, teach their own. <laughs> yeah. Now, so you've been on uh, Finding Bigfoot. Um, have you ever been on any other TV shows besides Finding Bigfoot? Yes. Um, I've been on the Travel Channel, uh, Paranormal in the Park, National Parks or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, I've been in, in Discovery Channel, uh, Animal Planet, and almost all of the local TV stations here in Arizona. Awesome. Great. I mean, you, you're, you're rapidly becoming a very high profile name in, in the Bigfoot community and, and I and I was excited that you agreed to do the show. Um what what can we expect from you in the near future? What what do you got going on now? Well a lot of people have wanted me to expand and create an organization much like the BFRO. Mm -hmm. But I don't think I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna let the BFRO do what the BFRO does. Sure, sure. Um, I'm I'm in it for the research, and I want to do more research. Uh, I'm looking to develop several other areas, and when I say develop, I mean um, determine how many Bigfoot there are in a certain area and try to get them accustomed to me to where they don't throw rocks and sticks at me anymore. <laughs> That's true. Now, speaking of throwing rocks and sticks at you, we, we mentioned a minute ago about the that you've had some experience. What's your favorite experience? What which one really sticks out in your mind that you like, 
wow, that, that was a great, great experience. Well, probably the most controversial one is uh, when we found a nest. Uh, it was made out of pine needles. And uh, I, when I was, we found it, I was with a group of, uh, oh, I think, eight or nine people. And we all stood around it and photographed it and talked about it and so forth. And um, so I decided, well, since we're all here and, you know, nothing has come out of the nest, it's probably empty. And so I decided to climb inside of it. Well, I climbed inside, and uh, when I climbed in the hole, my body kind of plugged off the light. Where to my natural eyes, it was dark. Sure. And I couldn't see anything. But with my camera that I had, it had an infrared, little, little tiny infrared LED. So I could see probably about 10 feet in front of me and if I looked at the uh, viewfinder itself. So I, I crawled in these, and I looked around, and I didn't see anything at first. And then I scooted in a little bit further and looked down at my camera viewfinder, and uh, there was a, well, I'm going to come right out and say it, a baby Bigfoot in a fetal position trying to push back as far into the back as it could and it looked terrified. Sure. And yep. uh, you can hear me if you watch the video you can hear me say oh there's something in here and uh, you know the, the guy's instructions were that if I climbed in there and uh, something happened they were grab my ankles and yank me out of there. <laughs> And did that happen? <laughs> well, I backed out in a real hurry. Sure, sure. And since it was a baby Bigfoot and we're a no harm, no kill organization, mm -hmm. we thought we did what we thought would be best, and that's hung cameras all over the trees looking at the nest. Sure. And um, then we backed off. We went away. And we are hoping that we'd either get mom or the baby coming out of that nest or coming to the nest. Mm -hmm. Well, next day when we went back, every one of my cameras were on the ground or looking in the bushes or out looking up in the sky. Oh, wow. So I think we were being watched the whole time. And mm -hmm. if, if uh, that baby would have started crying out, I think we could have been in some real problems. Sure. But uh, there's a lot of people that have seen that video, and uh, they have written me letters, uh, some of them very, not very pleasant, <laughs> cussing me out because I gave up the chance of a lifetime uh, to prove that Bigfoot existed and stuff like that. Well... Yeah. I think by doing what we did, showing that the red shirt people are not a threat to the Bigfoot, we have been able to have other opportunities to be able to get insight on what they do. Sure, sure. It, I think it kind of helped with the trust level. So, Absolutely. Um and uh, when I say the red shirt people, that's because I insist that everybody that goes mm -hmm. wear a red shirt. And that Makes is, uh, that's also one thing that keeps them from getting shot while in the bushes. Right. And the other so one for safety is, purposes. Yeah. The other one is, is I want to be able to kind of relate to the Bigfoot that we're the same clan that, you know, the red shirt people are my clan. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. So, kind of differentiate your group from the hunters out there with the guns and everything else. I, I see what you're saying. Yeah. So that's probably my most closest encounter and so forth. Now, the other encounters, you know, I've seen them, uh, spotted them doing some things, and then they spot me and run away. Um, and that's 
kind of another thing. I don't go through the forest acting like a hunter. I don't try to disguise my scent. I don't hide. In fact, when I'm in the forest, I kind of walk through the forest talking to my camera. And I do this on purpose. It's because I know that the Bigfoot can outrun me. They can outsmell me. They can outsee me. Uh, they're stronger than I am, you know, and I'm in their home. And so trying to act like a predator, they just will disappear. They'll melt away and be gone. Sure. But if I can tweak their interest, um, then they might kick back and watch me from a distance, and I might get a shot out of, of them with a, a zoom camera or something, you know. Sure. sure. That's the difference. <laughs> now, you, you mentioned um, that you got letters people, you know, basically cursing you out that you missed a chance of a lifetime and this and that. And and, and I got to tell you, you know, I, I love the fact that you're so laid back and that you don't get involved in the, you know, the, the political issues, if you will, and, you know, going on right now in the Bigfoot community. But maybe you could give some some of our new researchers some advice in avoiding that uh, that mess that's out there right now. Well, to start with, grow a real thick skin because you're going to run into people that just chew you up one side and down the other. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it, it's a, a business that you have to be in it for love. Uh, you know, you won't make any money at it. It's something you got to do because it, it compels you. It, it, it is something you have to do or want to do. Um, I can honestly say this is the best job I've ever had. It's the poorest paying job I've ever had. <laughs> but it's it's fun. It's interesting. Um, and I can also say that Bigfoot has saved my life. Um, because of Bigfooting, um, I have been able to be healthier. I've lost over 60 pounds. Um, you know, it, it just it's given me a reason to live. That's awesome. So, you know, in an indirect way, they have saved my life. Well, that's a uh, that, that, that's great. I mean, you know, I, I I love to hear um, where people appreciate nature and, and what's out there, as opposed to um, the people who want to go out there and just basically, you know, run amok, you know, and, uh, and and I think it's great when you go out there. Cliff Bragman told me, he said, uh, he said he doesn't even care if he gets anything or not because he just loves being out there, and I thought that was such a great point to make because uh, enjoy it, you know. You're not going to find Bigfoot every time you go out. You're not going to see a Bigfoot every time you go out, but just enjoy nature. Enjoy your visit to, enjoy your visit out there, so I think that's a good point, and, and it will save your life because it makes you want to go out again. Right. Now, I, I do want to plug, before we close, I do want to plug your, your website because I, I think it's a great website, uh, the mogionmonster.com, and that's, uh, I'm, I'm going to spell that real quick so the listeners can get the correct spelling. It is M-O-G-O-L-L-O-N-M-O-N-S-T-E-R.com. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. <laughs> So make sure you guys make sure you guys listen to this. Make sure you take a minute when we're done and uh and go check that out as well. So we got Don Davis and we got the Mogion Monster dot com. We want to check both those out. And uh, Mitch, listen, I, I I've enjoyed our, our conversation. Um you I uh, you I have a lot of respect for you and what you do. Um but I at the end of every show I give my guests an opportunity to close it out for us. Uh you can talk about anything you want to talk about, maybe something I missed. Um, but the floor is yours. Okay. Well, one thing I would like to mention is that I'm a very open sharing type uh, person. I will try to share everything I've got unless it gives away a specific location which might endanger a Bigfoot or a clan to what I call Bigfoot hunters. Um, I encourage people to watch my videos and go through them frame by frame and help help me look for Bigfoot. Um, 
there has been many people that have done that and have been able to find faces and uh, spot uh, actual Bigfoot and uh, call my attention to it. And I go back to it and look at the uh, original footage, make sure it's there. And then I post it in what I call the Bigfoot Face Database. Now, a lot of people say that this is um, optical illusions and uh, squatch blobs and stuff like that. But in science, what you really need to do is collect all of the data. You never throw anything out. It's like brainstorming. You never throw any idea out. But what you want to do is watch for reoccurrences, uh, matching faces and, and at a different time or a different place. Because each time you come up with a matching face or uh, at a different time or a different place, the probability of that face being a real Bigfoot just jumps dramatically. And if you get three sightings, same face, then that's pretty real. It's, you know, that's, that's really really a very good optical illusion if it's that. But no, after three, it's it's pretty done deal. So watch the videos. Uh, watch them very carefully. Look in the nooks and crannies. I'm told that it works best if you uh, use a high-definition uh, screen, blow it up as big as you can, and then use the space bar to go go uh, uh, frame by frame. So mm -hmm. that's the one way you can be a part of my team. Well, I think that's very well said. And uh, now your videos can be found at on YouTube, what's the name of your uh, channel? The name of the channel is Susan Farns. That's Susan, F-A-R-N-S. Or you can go to my website, and they're listed in the Bigfoot Mogion Monster um, galleries. I think I have like 23 or 24 galleries. Great. And they, that goes all the way back from day one all the way up to current. So, well, I know I'm definitely going to check it out here in a little bit myself. And uh, Mitch, I appreciate you taking the time today to, to join me. And uh, with that, I think we are done. Very good. That was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm.